Hmm, this looks interesting. So Blur X is cutting off the left hand edge of the histogram, but it's only really apparent in log view. Wonder if I can reproduce this. I wonder what's going on. Maybe I should open up an image and have a look. This one will do. Let's open up GHS, zoom in, we'll open up log view, Ooh, better reposition that a little bit, we'll open up Blur X, and let's see what happens. Oh wow, it really did. Have I just confirmed that there's something disastrously wrong with Blur X? I'm going to be the most hated astrophotographer in the world, aren't I? Well, hopefully not. In fact, I'm not the first to notice this issue, and Russell himself is aware of it, and he will be providing an update to Blur Exterminator in the near future that will fix it. But let's have a look at a few of my images to see if we can work out a little bit what might be happening. So I have, as I say, three here. So here is an S2 image of the Statue of Liberty Nebula. Um, and if I look at GHS here and, and try and find that left-hand edge, okay, so that there's the normal histogram. We're in log view because it's much more apparent in log view as the video opener suggested. Um, and if I apply Blur X to this, and I've already done it um, just to save some time. So if I apply Blur X, it does indeed clip that left hand edge. Turn it off, turn it on. It's readily apparent that it's clipping. But here's a HA image of mine of the Dragons of Arrow upside down, but that's all right. Again, if I find the left hand edge of this histogram, and then I apply Blur X, pretty much nothing changes. That left hand edge doesn't clip, just to show you it's not really hiding off the edge there. Not much is changing. There's a little bit, but it's essentially just a bit of noisiness, right? It's not really changing much, not compared to the, the clipping that happened in the S2. Uh, and here's another HA image of Eta Carina. So again, if I move that edge, this one's even less change. So what do I think is happening? Well, my two HA images, because HA is uh, so abundant, they have particularly high signal to noise ratio, uh, whereas compared to the S2 anyway, which has a much lower signal to noise ratio. And I think that's the crux of it. This is affecting low signal to noise ratio images more than high signal to noise ratio images. And I don't think that's surprising. The training set that Russell used probably was largely higher signal to noise ratio images. And that makes sense because deconvolution is most effective when you have a high signal to noise ratio. So there's no surprise that it's affecting lower signal to noise ratio images because they're just not what deconvolution is designed to, to work with. But that wasn't enough. I asked Russell for some more information um, to describe what he thought was happening. Uh, and it was rather interesting. Um, so I thought I'd kind of demonstrate what is happening under the hood uh, with this image. So this image, as I, I said, has high signal to noise ratio. Um, so it won't be affected by blur exterminator. And in fact, I'm going to open up GHS so we can see that um, left hand tail again. I'm not actually going to use GHS here. I just want to have it open so that we can see this left hand tail here. Um, and I'm going to do something to demonstrate what's happening. And then I'll explain why I did it. So I'm going to open up Auto Histogram, which is one of the stretching tools in PixInsight here, and, and reset it. Um, and I'm going to turn off the, the screen transfer function here so we can see. Um, and I'm going to use the, the MTF function here, the median transfer function. And I want my median value to go to 0 0.3. And you can see that's a fairly okay stretch. Okay, and if I zoom back out and turn log view off here uh, for this image, I can see that my median is pretty well at the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, where I kind of expected it to be. So this isn't a perfect normal distribution, so the peak isn't necessarily the median, uh, but you can see it's roughly in the right spot to what we expected it to be. Okay, uh, but the background's perhaps brighter than what we expected. We've got this 
space here on the left hand edge and normally on GHS we'd use the linear tool and um, adjust the black point maybe or use histogram transformation to adjust the black point um, more to our liking but we can do that in our histogram as well so if I undo it um, I'm going to keep that 0 0.3 but I can do that same thing by looking at clipping so if I adjust the shadow clipping let's maybe adjust it to something crazy like 0 0.3 and then work with my image. So you can see the contrast now is huge. Uh, the background is a lot darker. Um, it's looking more like what we'd see, but I've clipped my image, okay? I've clipped my image on the left-hand edge. Now, if I used the linear option in generalized hyperbolic stretch here and moved that black point away again, look at that. That left-hand edge is clipped just like we saw with Blur Exterminator. And now we can explain why I just did what I did. So talking to Russell, the way he's described BlurX and the machinery behind it in the background, and he explained it to me in a high level because um, I wasn't ready for all the, the maths at that time in the morning, um, even though I'm a mathematician. Um, he said that what BlurX does is it takes your linear data stretches it, applies its magic, and then does the inverse of that stretch back to the linear state. And he said the reason it does that is it needs all of the, the data to be normalized within a certain range. Um, so it needs to stretch it to a certain point so all the, the data is where it needs it to be to, to run effectively, and then it can put it back. The problem is it does, just like it with the auto histogram here, it, it sets a, a kind of clipping value for the shadows to, I guess, maximize that kind of contrast between the background and the, the nebulosity that it needs, uh, or the noise floor and, and the nebulosity that it needs. Um, and it's, it's overestimating that shadow clipping value at the moment. Um, and it seems to be most readily an issue with low signal to noise ratio images. Before we finish though, I should probably show you how you can deal with the issue right now. So here's that S2 image again, um, and we'll zoom in again on that tail so we can see it. Where is it? There it is. Turn on log view. Um, actually, we better reset that black point to, to zero. There we go. So there's that tail, and we'll go back to generalized hyperbolic stretch. Um, so if, as we know, if, if we apply BlurX at the moment, it cuts it off. Um, how do I deal with that? Well, at the moment, the easiest way to do it is to use a luminance mask. So I'm just gonna duplicate this image and just do a default screen transfer function. Permanently apply that to the histogram, kind of the quick and dirty way to make a, a luminance mask, right? And you'll see this is more than sufficient to deal with the problem. So if I apply that mask now, that, that stretched luminance, and now I run Blur Exterminator, uh, which I'll speed through because it'll take a little bit of time. Then you'll see that that, why am I pointing? You can't see that that left hand edge won't clip this time. Actually, I probably didn't even need to fast forward that. That was pretty quick. Uh, so look at that. The, the left hand edge hasn't been affected at all. So there you have it, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek opening to the uh, the video, but hopefully we delved into uh, a rather interesting issue uh, with Blur Exterminator. Uh, when it's an issue, we've mentioned that it mostly affects lower signal-to-noise ratio images. Uh, I've just demonstrated to you how you can deal with that problem with the luminance mask right now. Um, I've given you a, a, a high level explanation as to why the issue is occurring. And the good news is that Russell is working on a fix right now. So I'm gonna leave you with the only real imaging that I've done for the last two years. And for me, it's unusual, it's of the moon. I'm Paul from Polyman Astro. Thanks for watching.